Well, thank you for that uh, introduction. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, my connection with this institution goes way back. Uh, I first came here in 1976 as a uh, college junior working on a senior honors thesis uh, and uh, had a fantastic time in that, that wonderful, wonderful old building, Upton Hall, uh, which used to house the Military History uh, Institute. And I'm uh, particularly delighted to say that uh, the gentleman who showed me around the archives, Dr. Dick Summers, uh, is here in the front row tonight. And uh, I may have aged, but he hasn't. <laughs> so um, in graduate school, like most students of international relations, the past that I studied was uh, chiefly the Second World War, and the present was the Cold War and our conflict with the Soviet Union. Uh, as you heard in that uh, introduction from 2007 to the beginning of 2009, I was counselor of the Department of State, where I spent a good deal of my time fretting about the, uh, the Taliban and uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq and the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps. So that explains why after leaving government, I came back to SAIS and finished a book about America's most persistent enduring and important enemy of all, Canada. <laughs> and that, that is the subject of this book, Conquered into Liberty. It describes how the American way of war originated during almost two centuries of conflict with Canada. And yes, I do mean Canada. Uh, because from the end of the 17th century through the first half of the 19th, our northern border was nothing like the, the sleepy, largely undefended frontier of today. It was a zone of violence and menace and invasion. Moreover, Conquered into Liberty is about a particular place, what Native Americans called the Great Warpath. That's the roughly 200-mile stretch of water and woodland between Albany and Montreal. And for those of you over there, there's Albany. There's Montreal, about 200 miles. I have more maps if, uh, if you want that we can, we can really go into this in excruciating detail. The book is framed by a series of battles, uh, and those are the French raid on Schenectady in 1690, just outside Albany, the siege of Fort William Henry in 1757, the so-called battle on snowshoes. It was, uh, a, a, it was a small battle, but a very bloody one in 1758. The British siege and uh, catastrophic assault on Fort Carrion, now Fort Ticonderoga, in 1758. The American siege of the uh, uh, Canadian river port of St. John's in 1775. The Battle of Valcour Island at the northern end of Lake Champlain in 1776. The Battle of Hubbardton, the only battle, Revolutionary War battle fought in Vermont in 1777. Uh, there's a chapter on what I call phantom campaigns from 1778 to 1783. Uh, a, the Battle of Plattsburgh in 1814 uh, at the northern end of Lake Champlain. And then finally a chapter called Rumors of War, 1815 to 1871, which in many ways culminates with a Confederate raid on St. Albans, Vermont in 1864 which by itself is a very curious tale. To give you a sense for how the book reads, uh, this is how chapter one opens. At five o'clock in the morning on February 9th, 1690, a bleeding man on a wounded horse staggered into the fortified, winter-bound Dutch town of Albany. Despite the bullet in his thigh, Simon Skimmerhorn had ridden nearly 20 miles in six hours from Schenectady to Albany through knee-deep snow. The mayor, mayor, Peter Schuyler, hastily convened a meeting of the aldermen to hear the exhausted Skimmerhorn's grim news. Just before midnight on the 8th, a party of French and Indians had stormed Schenectady, killing most of its inhabitants, carrying off others, and setting its houses on fire. In the following days, some 50 survivors of the Schenectady massacre, many suffering from frostbite, trudged their way to Albany. They and their horrified hosts eventually pieced together what had happened. Why begin the story in 1690 with the attack on Schenectady? Uh, 
Well, it's because it was important in a number of ways, and not least in that it represented a major departure in French strategy. The first in a series of assaults on New York and New England towns, including some like Schenectady, with which the French had actually had pretty good relations, aimed at pinning down American and English forces on the frontier. Consider it, if you will, a major act of state-sponsored terrorism, because that's what it was. The intention of the raiders was not, Schenectady was not really a military target, it was very much a civilian target. The intent was to inflict devastation uh, on that town, as happened. Um, it was designed not to take a few prisoners, but to obliterate the place. By the way, most of the raiders, including those who committed the atrocities, were Europeans, not Indians. Schenectady illustrates a point that is probably familiar to many people here, but not to most Americans. And that is that it was part of a much larger conflict. Or you can think of it this way. What we like to call World War I was, by my count, World War VII. Starting at the end of the 17th century, there were a series of conflicts which were truly global, often fought in places as remote as India, Mediterranean, the Caribbean. All of them had their echoes in the United States. So what European historians call the Nine Years' War in uh, the Americas was called King William's War. The War of the Spanish Succession was known to the colonists as Queen Anne's War. The War of the Austrian Succession King George's War. The Seven Years' War, we know as the French and Indian War. The War of American Independence, we sometimes forget, turned into a global war in which, from the British point of view, America was not necessarily the most important theater. The wars of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars led to two American wars, it was sometimes known as the Quasi-War with France, and then, of course, the War of 1812. All of these conflicts dragged North America in, or in the case of the Seven Years' War and the War of Independence, they actually originated here. The fact is that uh, that great body of water, the Atlantic Ocean, did not separate America from Europe. It actually linked it to Europe. And more deeply yet, it seems to me that students of American foreign policy and American military power and military history often underestimate the extent to which the American approach to war was colored by our early experience. By that, I mean the colonial as well as the Revolutionary War and early federal experience. Every bit as much as by the Civil War and World War II. Now, Conquered into Liberty discusses some very different kinds of battles. Some of these you might call decisive. The Battle of Plattsburgh in 1814, which was both a, a, naval, a maritime uh, fight, a very decisive maritime fight, very one-sided, in which the Americans really crush a, uh, a Royal Navy flotilla, and a, a somewhat less conclusive land engagement. Battle of Plattsburgh was indeed decisive because it had a very large effect on the way in which the Americans and British negotiated uh, the Treaty of Ghent. Uh, the Battle of Plattsburgh really marked, in many ways, the moment in our history, the first moment in our history, when foreign powers realized that they could not hope to ever project military power into the American heartland. That was really the last point at which the British and certainly other powers thought that there was any prospect of being able to put military power anywhere other than along the American coast. Some of the fights I talk about were very big. Uh, the attempt in 1758 uh, by the British to storm Fort Carrion, now Fort Ticonderoga, involved the largest army that had ever been assembled in North America until that time, 15,000 uh, soldiers, Americans and, uh, and British, uh, who were hurled back by scarcely a fifth as many Frenchmen. Some of the other fights, uh, much more minor. The Battle in Snowshoes was in some ways a mere skirmish. But all of these fights are, I believe, in a broader sense, revealing. That is, individually and collectively, they tell us a great deal about why the United States wages war the way it does. And what I do in each of these chapters is explore some of the connections with American strategic culture today. Now, I can illustrate that in a couple of ways. Uh, perhaps the best is to begin with the title, Conquered into Liberty. I explain that in chapter five, <clears throat> 
which deals with the American invasion of Canada in 1775. It's important to remember, because the Canadians have not forgotten this, although most Americans have, uh, we invaded Canada before we had even declared independence. In the opening uh, phase of that invasion, actually preceding it, uh, was a very well organized campaign of subversion directed by the Continental Congress. And part of what that campaign was the writing of a pamphlet in French addressed to the French inhabitants of Canada um, intended to undermine British rule. That pamphlet began with the words, you have been conquered into liberty. Now that's a very interesting notion if you think about it. The idea that people can be conquered into liberty. I would contend it's a very American idea and an idea that we have pursued sometimes with great success, sometimes with uh, equally considerable failure for a long, long time. And it started here. In the case of Canada, it failed. Uh, it was probably inauspicious that the pamphlet, which was spread around by American secret agents, was not widely read because, by and large, the population of French Canada was illiterate. And uh, the people who could read, which were mainly members of the clergy and uh, uh, the gentry, had no idea of putting subversive idea in, ideas into the heads of uh, French uh, Canadian peasants. But the Americans tried hard. Uh, George Washington, who orchestrated this assault, while he was commanding the Continental Army outside Boston, ordered his subordinates to subdue their deep-seated mistrust of the French Catholic Church. Remember, Washington is commanding a uh, overwhelmingly Protestant army. And this is the guidance that he gives to the American forces which are invading Canada, one along the Great Warpath uh, route led by uh, Brigadier General Richard Montgomery, a second uh, contingent led by Benedict Arnold that marches through the woods of Maine. His instructions read, while we are contending for our own liberty, we should be very cautious of violating the rights of conscience in others. Ever considering that God alone is the judge of the hearts of men, and to him only in this case, they are answerable. George Washington was motivated by some very hard-headed notions about power. He was in favor of the invasion of Canada because he wanted to push Great Britain off the North American continent. But he was also motivated by ideals like those. By the way, uh, Washington did not want the French back in Canada at the end of this, and he was quite willing to double cross his uh, protege, the Marquis de Lafayette, in order to keep them out, but that's another story. The book describes Benjamin Franklin's journey north along Lake Champlain in April 1776. Uh, that was a tremendous ordeal for a 70-year-old man at that time of the year. And anybody who's traveled up in the North Country in April knows it can be pretty grim. And Franklin was old and sick. And in fact, uh, at one point, he really just concluded the trip was going to kill him. And he begins writing farewell letters to his friends. Why was Benjamin Franklin? Uh, America's greatest statesman sent north at that time of the year along the Great Warpath route to Montreal. Well, what had happened was the Americans had a major foothold in Canada. Uh, they had occupied Montreal. They were besieging Quebec. But they hadn't all of it, and Congress feared, <coughs> appropriately so, that the invasion was faltering. And so, therefore, they sent Franklin as I said, their most able statesman, North, in order to instruct the Canadians about the nefarious schemes of the British Parliament, uh, to teach them the true principles of government, uh, <clears throat> to instruct them about things like the rights of habeas corpus, which they did not have. And his instructions continued, you are to establish a free press. And then the same instruction continued with, with no evident sense of irony and give directions for the frequent publication of such pieces as may be of service to the cause of the United Colonies. So there's a, there's a contradiction that runs, that runs throughout. Franklin failed, of course, but he gave the British quite a scare. And that American approach to the conquest of Canada, that idea of conquering into liberty, is one that is being played out 
in some ways even today. The book talks about several phantom campaigns. Those are conflicts that might have happened but did not, and I want to say a few words about that. One of the things I took away from my own experience in government was a very keen sense of how things that you think are going to happen, but happen not to occur, can seem extraordinarily real at the time and have a powerful effect on people making decisions in ways that I'm not sure historians always capture adequately. Some of the phantom campaigns I talk about in the book are a proposed invasion of Canada in 1779. That was to be conducted by a French fleet, uh, which would attack Canada up the St. Lawrence Seaway, combined with a, an American overland invasion, which would go up the north, north along the Great Warpath route. The idea would be that it would be an American army, but it would be led by the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, supported by a number of the French officers who had been seconded to the American forces. And this is the one that, that Washington uh, made a tremendous effort to subvert, to include telling Lafayette that it was time for him to take leave to see his wife, who he knew Lafayette missed, uh, to go back to France, because he wanted, Washington really wanted to kill this scheme. Another phantom campaign is the extraordinary tale of uh, the Vermont negotiations with the governor of Canada from 1780 through 1781. This was a negotiation that was conducted by the leading patriots of uh, Vermont, to include Ethan Allen. Uh, Vermont, patriotic Vermont historians after the war said, well, they were just pulling the wool over uh, British eyes. That seems not to have been the case. Uh, there was a serious negotiation, there was a serious possibility Vermont could have ended up as an independent state under British protection, which is where the negotiations were, were going had not Yorktown occurred. And there's even a phantom war, that is a third Anglo-American war, which was generally expected at different points in the 19th century, and which I believe was a real possibility at least through the Civil War, which again touched this area particularly in the form of the St. Albans Raid of 1864. This was a, a raid conducted <clears throat> during the, I should say, during the Civil War, the major foreign station for the Confederate Secret Service was in Canada. Uh, in fact, uh, it was based in Montreal. We even know where it was located. It was the only hotel in Montreal that served mint juleps. Uh, and we also know, among other things, very intriguing fact that John Wilkes Booth spent 10 days there in uh, early 1864. And what he was doing is not entirely clear, although people, of course, have their, their doubts. And there were a whole series of Confederate covert actions and some not so covert into, mainly into the Great Lakes region, but there was this one raid into St. Albans, Vermont, which came quite close to bringing the United States and Great Britain to blows. And again, one of the things I stress is uh, that one, what one can take away from the study of these phantom campaigns is contingency. Things don't have to turn out the way they did. Contingency, of course, also takes us to the role of personalities, something which I, again, I think I took from government to this book. I talk about a number of characters here, including some which, to the public at any rate, are uh, unfamiliar, as well as some that are quite familiar. Although what I believe I do is take some of the characters that we think we know and turn them a little bit upside down. So we have a very heroic Benedict Arnold, who in many ways saves the American Revolution through his efforts in 1776 and 1777, a pretty treacherous Ethan Allen, and a downright Machiavellian George Washington. But some of the less interesting names are, to my mind, even more interesting. For example, a man named Justice Sherwood. He had been a member of the Green Mountain Boys uh, who turned into a loyalist, uh, escaped the Simsbury Mines, which was sort of the gulag of the American Revolution, and ran uh, British covert action and intelligence operations into Vermont throughout the second half of the war. A fascinating character. Or Judithan Baldwin, the self self-taught constructor of forts who became the founder of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. 
Or perhaps my, uh, my absolute favorite, uh, Le Corne Saint-Luc, a French leader of Indian raids over 40 years, whose life story is quite amazing. Uh, just to give you the, uh, probably the most exciting part of it, he, he begins leading very brutal raids into the English colonies in the 1740s, a complete terror throughout the Seven Years' War, probably responsible for some part of the massacre of some of the prisoners at uh, Fort William Henry, is leading raids deep into New York to the very end of that conflict. At the end of it, he decides uh, he really doesn't want to live under British rule, so he goes back to France, which he had never seen before, and he sets sail in a ship that catches fire three times as it's sailing uh, down the St. Lawrence, is caught in a storm off Cape Breton Island. This is the middle of winter. Uh, the ship is running into the rocks. His two sons who were with, with him slip out of his arms and drown as he's getting ashore. There are only six survivors plus uh, Saint-Luc. He uh, pulls them together. The captain is there, but he's completely useless. Uh, the next day, he makes sure they bury the dead. They build a fire. He then goes, finds a group of Indians, hands the, uh, his, uh, his comrades over to them uh, with assurances of safekeeping, and then walks 1,500 miles to Quebec in the dead of winter to get help. He decides to stay in Canada. He uh, uh, offers his service first to the British during the Revolution. When the Americans invade, he shows up in the American camp offering his services to them. They don't trust him, arrest him. They can't pin anything on him. He, uh, he's released. He goes back to the British. He leads John Burgoyne's Indians in the invasion of uh, uh, New York in 1777. He deserts Burgoyne just before the Americans close in goes back, marries a woman 35 years younger than himself, and dies the second richest man in Canada. I mean, you can't beat that. One of the things I've, I've tried to do in this book, by the way, is to explain as best I can the perspectives of French Canadians, British, and Indian actors along the Great War Path. It strikes me as a great weakness of a lot of the literature that we tend, as, as is true of so much of American military history, to focus simply on ourselves. Let me give one final example of how the book draws some connections between past and present. Uh, one of the things we do at SICE, as of course people do at the Army War College, is the staff ride, a kind of case study, as it were, conduct conducted on the ground. And in some ways, what the book is about is trying to take readers along as it were, a kind of staff ride, or a virtual staff ride, to the Great Warpath region. So, uh, one of my favorite sites, uh, Fort Ticonderoga, and the re retreat from Fort Ty in 1777. In the summer of 1777, American forces evacuated Fort Ticonderoga at the southern end of Lake Champlain. This is in the face of the great invasion from Canada led by Major General John Burgoyne. The retreat turns into a rout in which the Americans lose their equipment, their stores, and a lot of their self-respect. Some of that self-respect is uh, regained a few days after the, the abandonment of Fort Ty at the only real battle fought in Vermont, the Battle of Hubbardton, which I describe, which is a very bloody little rearguard action. A year after these events, a court-martial tried Major General Arthur Sinclair, who had been the commander of Fort Ticonderoga, who was a professional soldier, uh, a veteran of the British Army, a regular by training and also by outlook. And one of the things I explore in that chapter had been the tension between him and the militia, those part-time soldiers upon whom he had to depend but whom he did not trust, and of whom he was quite critical, particularly their leader, uh, the leader of the Vermont militia, Seth Warner, who was actually quite an able commander. At the end of the chapter, I bring the reader up to the present describing a trip I took to Fort Ty with about 40 colonels, where, among other things, we reenacted the court-martial of Arthur Sinclair. I reduced the uh, charge sheet, the, yeah, there were actually three different charges, to one, which is a, a wonderful 18th century charge, incompetence as a general. 
We, we no longer court-martial generals for incompetence, uh, but in the 18th century they did. And here's how the, uh, the chapter ends. Having completed the exercise, the instructors made some final remarks, summing up arguments on both sides, suggesting parallels with the kinds of problems the colonels might find themselves dealing with in the future, saying a few words about the carefully reconstructed site of Fort Ticonderoga itself. And then a poll. Could all of you who voted to acquit Sinclair please raise your hands once again? About 25 of the 40 raised their hands. Now, would all of you who would be willing to have your son or daughter serve under him please keep your hands up? One by one, the hands went down. After a pause to digest this ambivalent outcome, the instructors recounted Sinclair's further career. After the revolution, during which he continued to serve but never in command, he became in 1787 president of the Continental Congress for one year, just as the new constitution was being drafted. Thereafter, he was appointed territorial governor of the Northwest Territory. A member of the Society of the Cincinnati, he helped found the city of that name. And in the summer of 1791, he went to war again. Sinclair led the bulk of the United States Army, such as it was at the time, against the Northwest Indians, who in Confederation had mounted a fierce opposition against the settlers pouring across the Appalachians. After months of painful marching and the construction of isolated forts, the Indians attacked Sinclair and his army along the Wabash River on November 4, 1791. Neither the regulars nor the militia accompanying them could hold their ineptly fortified camp. The Indians pounced, killing over 600 soldiers, wounding another 250, inflicting the greatest defeat ever suffered by the United States Army at the hands of Native Americans before or since. After careful deliberation, Washington replaced Sinclair with none other than the defeated general's predecessor 15 years before at Ticonderoga. Anthony Wayne. In the meantime, Congress once again investigated Sinclair. Once again, upon due consideration of the quality of his troops, the difficulty of his logistical predicament, and the challenges of the terrain, he was acquitted. Well, asked the instructor, whose fault was it? Sinclair's or the people who kept him in command? There was a prolonged silence, and then pondering the last question, the reflective colonels filed off to a pleasant dinner in a comfortable dining room overlooking the dark waters of Lake George and the green hills that loom over them. That chapter, like the book as a whole, tries to do several things. It describes a dramatic event, it explores the choices and the personal conflicts that shaped that event and its consequences. But it also tries to make some enduring points as well. The book is a serious history and it makes some serious arguments. But it's also intended to be, and I'd like to think that it is, a good and gripping read for readers who want to know more about this topic, these people, and this place. As a uh, close friend, a, uh, an old infantryman who read the manuscript described it, it is in its way a love note to the Great War Path, which I've been visiting ever since I was a boy. So let me conclude where the book begins, which is with the author's introduction. After describing some of the big themes of the book, including that bizarre notion of conquering others into liberty, the last paragraph describes my deepest aspiration for its readers. And as for the charm of the subject, if this book prompts those who read it to explore for themselves some of the places it describes, I will be glad. They will discover, as I did, that with an attentive ear, a modicum of imagination, and a wholesome curiosity about the past, one can still hear the echoes of musket and cannon shot, the shouts of command, the flap of canvas and creaking of oars, and even, with some effort, the near silent padding of moccasin shod feet. I hope you'll read the book, very much hope you'll buy it, uh, and if you do, I can promise you that vicariously at any rate, you will hear some of those echoes. Thank you very much. Each side of the room.
microphone up in just a second. Hold the microphone about here when you're speaking into it so that we can capture your question on camera. If that uh, dampens your enthusiasm to, to ask a question, please don't let it. Any questions to begin? Let me answer, ask the, answer the first one first. Yes, they are now sold out. The books are sold out. Questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> did you uh, mention in the book anything about Rogers Rangers? Yes, yes, I did. Thanks, um, thanks for that opening. Um, although uh, the, you know, the thought occurs to me that I'm surrounded by large numbers of former and probably some current Rangers, so I'm going to have to say what I'm about to say very carefully. Uh, one of the uh, fights that I described is the battle on snowshoes. This was a, uh, a, a, f a very bloody fight in March of 1758 outside Fort Ticonderoga. Rogers Rangers was a, uh, it's the, uh, the lineage of the 75th Ranger Regiment, goes back to, uh, to Robert Rogers, who was a New Hampshire frontiersman who raised a, a, a very effective unit of uh, Americans who performed ranger kinds of tasks. They did uh, reconnaissance raids. Uh, they also did some road building. Uh, but mainly it was this sort of raiding warfare back and forth across the no man's land, which really ran from a little bit north of Albany to somewhere south of Montreal. And in March of 1758, uh, uh, Rogers leading a uh, small force of a couple of hundred rangers <clears throat> it was approaching Fort Ticonderoga at the southern end of Lake Champlain. He and his men come across a force of French and Indians. They ambush them, and then they're counter-ambushed. Uh, as the second party comes out, they're driven back, uh, dispersed. Rogers, uh, the local legend has it that he slid down what's now called Rogers Rock. Uh, you couldn't slide down that, I think, and survive it. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty harrowing tale, and I, I tried to describe it well. I made a point of going up there in March, and I snowshoed it. Uh, so, and I, one of the things I try to do is give people a sense of the place and the feel and, and, and all that. Uh, and I must say it was, you know, I mean, I was very comfortable wearing microfiber and polar tech and all that, but, you know, as you begin clumping around uh, in snowshoes and you try to imagine what it was like with these muskets, which are completely useless once they're damp, and you imagine that you're he hearing the screams as uh, the wounded are being tortured to death by the Indians, because the Indians hated Rogers and his men, and they would immediately go to work on them as soon as they got their hands on them. Quite a disturbing thought. So that's the fight that I describe. But I, I talk in the rest of it about Rogers. And there, there are two aspects to it, which, as I said, the, uh, uh, the Rangers present might not like. Um, the first is that although Rogers looms very large in the history of American, of, the, of that unit and that kind of tradition, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is when you look at their overall performance, the French and the Indians were a lot better. That in most of the fights, as in the Battle of Snowshoes, I mean, which goes down in kind of myth, it was a disaster, it was a debacle. They lost over half their men. Uh, and the operation was a complete failure. And that's true. They, these guys are getting ambushed very effectively all the way to the end of the, the war, despite some major achievements. And so one of the things I then do is talk about, well, why, why were the French and Indians better? And the reason, I think, had to do with the French gentry who were particularly good at working with the Indians. And so there's almost a kind of excursion on the, your, your French backwoods aristocrat as a kind of military anthropologist who could bring these Indians together frequently from hostile, mutually hostile tribes. And these Indian war parties were usually not uniform. They were people who didn't even understand one another's languages. Uh, but what the French had was this small cadre of uh, backwoods gentry who turned them into very, very effective units. And of course, the Indians were naturally very good in the, in the woods. But on the other hand, so what, what was it that, what is the Rogers legacy? Well, I believe this is still true at uh, Fort Benning. When you go through ranger school, you get this card which has Rogers rules of ranging. Uh, 
what that actually what that is is they ripped it off from a Kenneth Roberts's novel Northwest Passage published in the 1930s. What Roberts was doing was putting as a speech in the mouth of an irascible sergeant uh, what was really the first manual on patrolling, which was about 25 pages long that Rogers wrote. And the argument that I make is that Rogers' real contribution is not, as one might think, this tradition of irregular warfare, although that's there too. He's the guy who realizes that this very difficult form of warfare can be taught to you know, willing frontiersmen who may not necessarily actually be all that adept in the woods, but you can make them good enough. So in a funny way, Rogers belongs to the tradition of the citizen soldier more than one might think. And it's largely because his idea is you can take best practices and you can teach it in a, in a manual, and you can, the result is you can get units which are good enough. And that's what the Rangers were. They were good enough for what they had to do vis-a-vis -vis the French and the Indians. Yes, sir. Oh, no, I'm, I'm paying attention to the area you're talking about here, which, which is nothing, which was a, war, a warrior's highway. Um, this was where Benedict Arnold had his best days, and I'm right. assuming he comes out fairly well. In, in, in part of the history that you're talking about. Yeah, Benedict Arnold does come out very well. Um, of course, the reason why this is the Great War Path, and again, if people want, I can scroll through this, is because this is a water route. And uh, with the exception of about 20 miles or so from Fort Edward to the southern end of Lake George, uh, you can go by water the whole way. And so this is a, this is a natural highway. It was not a particularly uh, settled area. It was not an agriculturally productive area, so you couldn't really live off the land, but it was a terrific, uh, a terrific route. Arnold comes off very well. Um, one of the battles I talk about is the Battle of Valcour Island, which is um, Alfred Thayer Mahan, the great and the founder of American, or great founding thinker about American sea power, says probably the most important naval battle in American history, where Arnold improvises a fleet out of nothing and uh, by delaying the British, forces them to postpone their invasion from Canada to 1777. Now, um, again, here I'm gonna get to dangerous territory. What I do is to go up to the present, as I try to do in each of these chapters, um, I talk about Arnold and how our memory of Arnold has been shaped. Uh, of course, if you've been in the old chapel at West Point, you'll know that his name is up there with the other generals, and then it's chiseled out. Right? If you go to the surrender site at Saratoga, where Burgoyne and his army surrendered, there's a five-story monument. And at the top, there are these niches for life-size statues um, and who are for the heroes of Saratoga. And there's Philip Schuyler, who had been the overall commander, Horatio Gates, his successor, Daniel Morgan, leader of the riflemen, and facing the battlefield of Saratoga, an empty niche. On, on the battlefield at Saratoga, where, where Arnold uh, is wounded, uh, really saving the day, Gates was kind of back in his command post, a mile behind the, the, the lines, away from the fighting. He's wounded in his leg. Uh, they pull the horse off him. They're saying, sir, where you hit? He says, it's my leg, the same leg that I was hit in at Quebec. I wish it were my heart. There's a monument there to the most brilliant soldier of the, American, of the War of American Independence. That's on one side. On the other side, the bas relief of a leg, but not his name. Well, at the end of that chapter, talking about Arnold, I say, uh, I, I give an account of the dedication of that surrender monument at uh, Saratoga. It's dedicated in 1877. It was a huge deal, thousands of people there. Think about it, all veterans, the men, almost all veterans of the Civil War. The, uh, and then of course there are the speeches. And the speech, one of the speeches was given was by the, uh, the governor, the, the Civil War governor of New York, who was the guy who kind of tolerated the draft riots 
1863, which also turned into a racial pogrom. Uh, and a lot of the speeches are basically sliming Arnold, because what people are doing is they're, they're holding on to the revolution as something that unifies the country so they can avoid thinking about the Civil War. And um, in something that has undoubtedly killed uh, the sales of the book in some parts of the country, one of the things I say, let's, let's think about how we've treated Arnold in our history as the epitome of treason. So who was worse, Arnold or Robert E. Lee? And no question in my mind, Robert E. Lee. I mean, Arnold was fighting for a country that didn't even exist. His contributions to the country much greater than Lee ever, ever made. Um, in terms of being responsible for the slaughter of American soldiers, no question. You know, think how many, how many souls uh, should be resting on, on Robert E. Lee's conscience. And the point that I'm trying to make there is that large parts of our, mil of our military history are these kinds of constructed stories that we have, which are in some respects comfortable for us. You know, if you really thought that Robert E. Lee was a worse traitor than Benedict Arnold, it gets a lot less comfortable. Um, I just had a question about the St. Alban raid, and uh, if you could possibly uh, talk a little bit about lessons from it, and also um, just from the aspect of the craft of being a historian, how did you go about, you know, digging up documents and putting this thing together? Yeah. Well, the, um, what the St. Albans raid was about was a series, there's a series of actions that the Confederates launched from Canada. Part of it, one of their, some of their bigger schemes were to um, spring Confederate prisoners of war from some of the prison camps along the Great Lakes. Those fall apart. But then in 1864, the Confederates are getting quite radical in terms of what they're willing to do. So one of the schemes that's launched from Canada is uh, trying to burn New York City to the ground. Have a bunch of agents uh, simultaneously set fires in some of the cheap hotels in uh, New York and create a conflagration which would be too great for the, uh, uh, to, be, to be put out. The mistake they made was the instructions were to keep the windows closed. They thought that that would stoke the fire, actually to put the fires out. Another was germ warfare. They uh, uh, sent clothes, nominally as a charitable uh, act, um, through cutouts to Union hospitals, clothes that had been worn by yellow fever patients. Now, they didn't understand that yellow fever is spread by mosquitoes rather than the clothes of, of patients who've had the disease. But it was, that was pretty serious. If they'd had sarin, they would have used sarin. Um, it was that, they were that determined. The, the raid on St. Albans uh, had a number of purposes. Partly it was to acquire money to fund these operations, so they ended up robbing a couple of banks. Partly revenge for the, Shen the burning of the Shenandoah because uh, the, uh, Vermont, Vermont contributed, uh, I think, more than any other state on a per capita basis to the Union Army. And uh, Vermont cavalrymen were quite prominent in some of the raids in the Shenandoah, so there was a bit of a revenge side to it. But I think the, the other part of it was a quite deliberate desire to bring Britain into the war. And what happens is the raid, the raid is uh, conducted by one of, it's led by one of uh, John Morgan's men. Uh, the, and this is a real special operations kind of thing. They, there are, I think, 19 troopers. They infiltrate in twos and threes. They all have cover stories. They stay at different places. They coordinate, they all, sh they all, they go to different places in the town, they take out their uniforms, uh, and they were gonna burn it down, but there was a rainstorm, so they couldn't pull that one off either. Well, uh, the, the locals were heavily armed um, and included soldiers who were on furlough, uh, and they pr get pursued across the border. This is stopped by a Brit some British soldiers who say, don't worry, we'll take care of these guys. They're put in a jail in Montreal where they're treated like heroes. Everybody shows up to have their pictures taken with them. 
British officers are buying them fancy meals. And then a Canadian judge says, well, this was not a criminal act. This was an act of war. Therefore, we have no jurisdiction. Release them. And that was the first time that um, the United States required passports to cross into Canada. They, we basically closed down our relations with Canada. Uh, General John Dix, after whom Fort Dix is named, uh, wants to launch preemptive strikes across the border to go catch and take off the battlefield terrorists who are raiding the United States. So this should have a somewhat familiar ring. He's actually reined in by the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, on Lincoln's orders, saying, you know, it's a really big deal to cut, conduct a cross-border raid. Um, and you, that's a decision the president has to make. Now, luckily, what happens is the British and the Canadian leadership realize this is really dangerous. And so they, they do round up the Confederates, throw them into jail. They're released after the war. Actually, they're released a little bit before the end of the war. But it does bring the two countries close to conflict. What, what I found very interesting, partly because I, I was dealing with this in government, was you know, terrorists coming across a border and the idea of cross-border operations by a zealous local military commander who may not be thinking about a larger political context. And it, it could easily have come to that. And when historians have looked at this say this was actually probably the most dangerous moment uh, in terms of um, Anglo-American relations. What, what people don't fully appreciate is Lincoln and Seward and all the rest were furious at the British. And Lincoln, at the very end of the war, says a number of things which makes it sound as if there's going to be payback when the war is over. So it was a, quite a, a precarious moment. Uh, the research of this took took me all over, uh, all over the place. Part of it, one of the most important things was simply walking the ground, of course. But th there are lots of, um, I, wherever possible, I use primary sources. And basically, they're pretty abundant for this period. The good news is a lot of them have been assembled in ways which are reasonably easy to use. Um, so for example, if you're interested in the early phases of the revolution, there's something called um, Peter Force's American Archives, which are massive collections of letters and newspaper articles and stuff like that. There are a terrific, the sign called the Documents on the American Revolution put together by the Brits, which really gives you a very good documentary account of things. But, but it involved a lot of rambling through those kinds of things, which was great fun, I have to say, after coming out of government. I mean, going, there's a lot to be said from leaving the 21st century and going back to the 18th. It's much more controllable. In the back, Jack. Going back to personalities a little bit, um, having read the book recently, one of the personality structures you hit that I really want to hear more about is the Marquis de Montcalm and, and some Bougainville. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very interesting, first of all, that there are not many officers that had their own personal historian that basically recorded the full history of his conflict. But um, you paint him as a very conflicted individual, which most, most authors have not. Yeah. Can you talk a little more about Montcalm and his deficiencies and, and efficiencies? Well, um, like other generals in history, Montcalm made a, uh, a great career move, reputation-wise, which was dying gloriously in battle. Um, really, you know, he dies uh, the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, which was a battle that he really botched in many ways. You know, the French actually outnumber the British in that decisive battle. And Mon Montcalm comes out of the walls of uh, Quebec at a time when winter is about to set in, so the British would not have been able to maintain themselves. But it's almost as if he wanted to go down swinging. And, and what you see in Montcalm, I mean, in, in there are many ways in which he was both an admirable man and a very competent commander. Uh, but his great failing was he could not work with either the Canadians or the Indians. And a large part of the story of the book is, on both the British side and the um, French side, 
those commanders who could, who could deal with both the Indians and the colonists, be they Canadians or Americans, and those who just couldn't. And by and large, those who just couldn't ended up failing. By the way, one of the other large themes of the book is how the American way of war ends up, I think, being a synthesis of kind of frontier warfare on the one hand and regular warfare on the other. Montcalm really just wanted to engage in regular European-style warfare. And he just had a lot of trouble adjusting to a world where that, that simply wasn't going to be, uh, that wasn't going to be sufficient. Uh, honestly, I think if he had, if he had not died at, uh, on the Plains of Abraham, his reputation would not stand so high. People have said the same thing about Wolfe, by the way. He's, I mean, they both die at the battle. I mean, you can't get any more glorious than that. Um, and it was a good career move. If, if Arnold had been killed at Saratoga, he would be one of the greatest heroes of the American Revolution. We'd be naming ships after him. You know, there'd be Benedict Arnold prizes. Um, it, it really a lot depends on when you exit the scene. <laughs> Other so questions? Advice for any budding generals out there. One more in the back. Elliot, you gave us a couple of really interesting and intriguing morsels about George Washington. At the end of the research, what's your general view? It, it, does it pull away from our popular memory? Or do you add new dimensions to this, uh, our sense of this man? Um, you know, it's an interesting thing that Lincoln is pretty remote from us in time, but somehow he feels more accessible to us than Washington does. Um, I came away with tremendous admiration for Washington, but with an appreciation that he had a very cold, rather Machiavellian side to him. And uh, you know, the, the, there's uh, some correspondence which I work with. When Lafayette is bringing forward this scheme which the Congress wants, which Ben Franklin wants, for the, the French assault on Canada in 1779. French fleet and American army led by Lafayette. And Lafayette, of course, we know, adored Washington. He worshiped Washington. By the way, in his memoirs, he says, the only regret of my life, and this is a guy who had a very long uh, and productive life, the only regret of my life is that I did not have the opportunity to liberate Canada on behalf of the United States. And Washington, what Washington is saying to the Congress is this. Lafayette says this is his own idea. I'm not so sure. And, and he really does make sure that Lafayette will not be in the continental United States in order to, to be able to execute this. So I think there was, a, there was a cold side, a cold calculating side to Washington, which fits with everything else. That said, um, you know, I, I got to know some wonderful historians when, while writing this book, uh, one of whom, alas, has uh, departed, uh, Don Higginbotham. And um, Don said to me that, uh, he said, you, uh, we were talking about Washington, and he said, do you know what the secret of George Washington was? I said, no. He said, the secret of George Washington is that he never stopped working on George Washington. And I think that's really true, that this is a guy who, who had his limits and was well aware of those limits, but was just always working on himself. So that, and I'll conclude with this story, because I, I just think it's, it's great. When he, when he first gets to Boston to take command of the Continental Army, he's looking around at these New Englanders. And this is a Virginia gentleman. There are blacks, I mean, acting like they're equal with white people. There are boys, there are old men. These people elect their officers. They don't know what discipline is. He thinks they're dirty. They probably thought the Virginians were dirty. And, and you know, the first couple of letters back to Martha are almost in despair. And then you can see the light bulb goes on. He says, he says to himself, in effect, you know, I'm the first American. So what does he do? As his personal bodyguard, it is entirely composed of New Englanders, commanded by a New Englander.
And I think he was, he was very good at that kind of thing, realizing, no, I can't think that way. And, and I have to do something that demonstrates that I don't think that way. So, you know, my sense of his greatness is in no way diminished. It's, I think just a more rounded conception of, of who he really is. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Well, Dr. Cohen, first of all, it's a, it's a thrill, a pleasure, and honor to have you back here once again to speak at the Army War College, again here uh, as a guest of the Army Heritage Education Center. It's always good to have one of our researchers come back here. Hi, Dr. Cohen. <laughs> um, the, uh, what we ask all of our speakers to do is to illuminate for us a little bit of American military history, something that even though many of us have uh, studied and read history most of our lives, something that we don't know or don't understand. You have certainly done that for, a, for a, uh, a big and important period of American military history, and more importantly, tied it to today. For that, we really appreciate that, and on behalf of our director, Colonel Matt Dawson, and the uh, Commandant of the Army War College, uh, Major General uh, Kukulo, we'd like to give you this uh, replica of your poster that we used to advertise this lecture, and uh, thank you for coming, and we hope you'll come back again. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.